Hello and most welcome to H80979. I can't even believe there's just 21 left until a full thousand. And I hope this will coincide with a big event on the quantum meeting we're having on the 25th. Uh, and that also coincides with Ascension, I think it's called in English. Christi uh, Himmelfeldstag. Ah, yes, Ascension. So that could be very interesting, actually. Wouldn't that be fantastic to hold a lecture on the Ascension Day? And that be thousand and celebrate with something nice. I will today talk about something that is similar to what Christ went through, and that is resilience. Resilience is a capacity to adapt successfully in the face of threat or disaster. And this is not something that is an inborn trait. This is something you can train. I spent some time uh, the day before yesterday with a fellow who had a really tough childhood. But he survived and the tough childhood actually made him much stronger, more resilient. Uh, he calls that that he is a child of the dandelion. And as you know, the dandelion survives everywhere. It doesn't matter if it's the middle of the city, in the middle of the road, in tarmac, with no nutrition, no water, nothing for it to survive. But still, it thrives. That is resilience. And actually, the dandelion is a very, very good picture of the strength of resilience. Resilience is deeply connected to the chaotic systems and what make them, makes them stable. They work by instability, so to speak. What makes a stream, the Milky Way, a human being, a plant to hold together are the differences, the inconsistencies. The vortex in a stream can linger on for centuries. The Milky Way is eons. But a perfect chaotic system is eternal. And that can only be achieved by resilience, to putting it to the test, exposing oneself to adversity. Adversis, adversities. And there is actually a very good metaphor here. It's so good because it comes directly from reality itself. It's uh, iron. If you want to make iron strong, you need to foster it. You need to temper it by putting it into cold water. This very cold water could break the iron. But if it doesn't break, it makes the iron incredibly much stronger. This is the process that is called hardening of the steel. And we learned that a little before the Middle Ages, and that made steel so much stronger, so much resilient, both harder and more flexible. For us to be able to be understandable, to understand other things, we also need to develop resilience. But to be sharp when, when needed, we also need resilience. So, in every way, this hardening process of the iron made both the iron more flexible than it was before, less brittle, but also stronger. And this is the odd thing with chaotic systems. You gain in both ends. There is no losing end here. And I think you notice here, in a way, there is the construction going on here. I think resilience is also about a sort of destruction, deconstruction. How is that? What do I mean? Well, normally 
we divide our lives into things that we preemptively class as bad and some other things that we preemptively a priori before the case deemed as being good and in the metaphysics of presence we try to strive away from the things that we subjectively deem to be bad and try to gather the ones that good you can hear the movement here it's the same old movement towards presence and we have also shown Derrida has shown that the intention of making for instance the, the, tox, the text stronger by having polarities actually weakens it we have the nullification and this is the problem with criticism criticism sort of eradicates itself quite literally it eradicates itself and that's a lesson to be learned from history criticizing never leads to newness it affirms the oldness because it's very simple to to make a negation it's too simple so it doesn't constitute a solution solution change development and the word teleolo teleology te I don't know how to pronounce teleology and that means directed towards something all those things are non-existent in a metaphysics of presence there cannot be there cannot be any direction if we establish polarities instead we have this nullification of everything no movement no sentido as they say in spanish it doesn't have a sense to it i got this idea when i read this letter very uh, hastily before uh, my brother law received the letter from uh, uh, the witnesses of jehovah but it struck me when i read the letter it was not written with any stamina or force it was like the person didn't have much emotional energy to <laughs> sort of put into the text it was very laconic uh, or boring to be honest an endless repetition of words the word truth as we noticed was repeated four times that goes in itself for uh, an almost Paul de Man deconstruction of what she was saying that she didn't really believed in it it didn't look that way this is what polarities does they nullificate and it doesn't help if in a discussion or in an event that we want where we want to do something we want to have something constructed a project whatever discussion political discourse you name it if I only say I am right I am right I am right I am right that's not very convincing it doesn't lead anywhere and to say I have the truth well it's even that bad people could say yes you're correct you have the truth and so what where are we going where is the direction can you get a feeling here that there is no energy there is no towards here it is almost a bit like stalemate when you play chess and you end up in a situation where you and the opponent can't do anything anymore and then we say game's over stalemate this is what happens with polarities and it's this that Derrida saw kindly and uh, lovingly I start to feel informs us about because with polarities there cannot be any development there can't be any sense to anything everything becomes completely undirected and it doesn't matter if you go up or down or left or right nothing matters what does it sound like well it sounds like and I would say it is absolute space absolute time and absolute knowledge everywhere and nowhere for everyone but at the same time for no one possible to use 
in every case everything can be made true but thereby also completely useless. Developing chaotic system is gaining more stability and gaining that thing that we have actually lost in the modern world and that is permanence. Our seeking for presence is a lookout for permanence. This girl looking for the truth, she is somewhere looking for something. She's looking for something stable, something that's permanent, something of a direction. But she might be looking in the wrong way. Trying to establish polarities actually enforces staticness, going nowhere, not developing. And as we've seen with Rodolphe Gachet, it makes awareness, reflection impossible as well. Polarities takes away our self-reflection. It actually takes away our soul. We become automata, automatically making differences on a non-thinking level. <laughs> and this is what I mean with resilience. If we start to divide everything in our world in good and bad, that is going to be subjective. And the second is we don't know if those things are bad or good until we try them. There is a problem uh, in doing a preemptive saying those things are really bad. In many cases, it turns out the bad things that I subjectively, emotionally deem to be bad have turned out to be very good. And I almost need a whiteboard here, but I, I will try to uh, show. If you do, if you have a totality here, like a big circle, and you divide it in two, that division is made before the fact. That means at least half of it is already gone once you enter in reality, presence. And that division is random because I don't know that reality. I decide. Resilience is our teleological project, and that's progression through time. Something polarities do not allow. With polarities we get stranded in a uh, no zone, no go zone. We, go, we don't go anywhere and the only thing we do is a sort of parasitic thing. So first we divide the wholeness that we had beforehand, anteriori, in two parts. We don't even know if those things are good or bad. So we both block out the good things, possibly, and the bad things. And this is this anteriority that is sort of a, a thing that Derrida deconstructs. And this is something Jordan Peterson never understood. In a way, both Jordan Peterson and Jack Derrida has the same project, and that's thinking being intelligent, being able to intellectualize. But whereas Jordan Peterson's uh, take on the whole thing is more like this big hole, and he deemed a certain area to be enemies and the other one friends. Daddy Da doesn't go about that way. He shows within both areas we can have good things and bad things. We need to discover first. So Daddy dies sort of pointing his finger. I can't imagine they are doing this nerdy gesture. But it's a little bit like that. It says, wait. Don't decide before in a random way what is good for you or bad for you. And it's this decidedness, of course, of the text. When I read the text, I decide the text. And me and the author could actually pull us both into the wrong direction. Both the writer will use polarity to strengthen his weakened state, like Kafka. And that 
will incline me to become even more weak, falling into the trap of polarities, not letting the full text come to the fore, not entering into the text. Very simplified is the same as saying, like I divide all books in schön literat uh, uh, ordinary literature and autobiographical literature, and it should have that division. That's something we talked about yesterday. Does it work? I don't think so. It doesn't even make sense, I'd say. Because how can you tell that a literary work is not autobiographical? And how can you tell the opposite? It is actually down to direction. And as more directed you are, the more you will actually give of yourself. And that will be true. That's the only thing that can be true. And Derrida's message is, this is actually something that the reader can appreciate. The, the listener also. The seer. The feeler. We can have a connection. And that connection can go over the pages. The author is not dead in that analytical, philosophical way. Maybe, I think Levinas could point to that, we never die. It's not certain, because a chaotic system never dies. It never ceases to exist. But then we need to enter into the chaotic system. And since we are stranded, this is another thing, we have different levels. And putting things into strict polarities is a lower level way of being. It is doing everything preemptively. It's a sign of it's that you're being weak. You need to protect yourself. It's a little bit like if you had a cold or a strong influenza is a better, better example. Then you will avoid people who are sneezing, coughing and so forth because you are in a state of weakness. And in our state of weakness, lower chaotic system with very low resilience, we will preemptively divide the world into good and bad, but on the basis of very little information. And this is what Derrida tries to help us, to get more into the text, but not more than we can handle. He doesn't force us. He doesn't tie our thumbs into some horrible instrument and says, you have to understand the text. It's not this analytical take that there is only one truth to the text. It's a constant deepening and you are involved in this process. And you see, this is a very good parable to understand resilience. Because the stronger and more chaotic you are, the more you will be able to allow yourself the text to speak for itself. So it's a scale where you, you lessen your subjectivity, you lessen your idea of what is good and bad, and then you can find what's truly good for you. And you can discard what's bad for you, unhealthy, what doesn't contribute to your healthy complexity. Remember what we know from a fractal theory. A complex system is always a healthy one. And an oversimplified system is always an unhealthy one. That goes for the Milky Way, it goes for plants, and it goes for human beings. And it also goes for text, understanding, intelligence, intellectualization, everything. The lack of complexity. And nobody is accused here. Derrida never accuses anyone. Even when he's speaking to John Searle, uh, before I went to bed, I, I put my eye to Limited Incorporated. He doesn't attack Searle at any level. He's being kind to him, actually. And of course, there is a, maybe a pointer in Limited Incorporated towards his limited take. But he shows that he can be a better analytical philosopher if he opens up a bit. His argument can actually be more pervasive. This is also the idea of resilience. It's 
entering in a project where you can't lose anything there's no loss game in resilience you get more of both you get more of all and this is what the lower idea denies us the lower idea says now half of reality is gone already that's poverty in a way and half of the text is going to be automatically gone for us and this is maybe the best reason to get more resilient and how do we do that well one way of going back uh, going into it is being absolutely practical because body and soul are connected in a way that makes them a hundred percent connected like a wave and a particle in the superposition but they're also two very different things but this means that we can train our body to become more resilient and then also our system will become it and we can both understand it which i'm trying to uh, sort of explain here but you can also do it so you have both ways and how you do it is being careful i will mention a few pointers here what one can do how to build resilience i named this paragraph we can make ourselves stronger more knowing and expanding by a little by little letting in more and more difference in our lives because it's this preempted horror vacuum scare that hinders us from sort of developing as well and getting stronger so the fear of the horror vacuum or the fear of the apeiron or the striving for presence they are in a way sides of this very same thing this is why we should a little by little in short time spans not to elongate it this is the working principle try to do things that has a start and an ending and within this area you expose yourself I did that yesterday, I exposed me, maybe too long, I went, I took it too far, but it's still a good example. Uh, I did it with a terrible hangover and it turned out to be very fruitful in the end, but it got a little bit too far. But what you need to do is trust the project, the teleology. You have a goal. That goal will with every repetition i make repetitions all the time i have the verses of bono this is a strange attractor this is how the liturgy worked in the monasteries and the uh, in the in the abysses they were used to have something to constantly come back to that's why it's so monotonous and repetitive but it becomes like a wall to lean on so you can go into the big unknown of the apeiron, of the horror vacui, the place you don't want to be. And what you're going to do is spend little time there, not too long. And you plan it ahead. As I did, I planned it ahead. I know it had a starting time. I know it had an end time. Because this is how our bodies work. They strain themselves for a while and then we take a rest and this is very important you need to know when you stopped the practice the exercise you stopped then you don't have to excel yourself anymore you can collapse into resting position or do whatever you want this is very important to tell the body system that that will happen every time you do that you will notice the body knows that because it has its own intelligence and it will be able to put more energy into the short time span this is here where you can push yourself to go a little bit further to the next level 
And that, oddly enough, that is intention. So that is good in itself. Because intention doesn't exist in the metaphysics of presence. It's just pure passivity. You are just a, a receptacle for knowledge. You don't do anything active. Here, with the intention of doing something for a while, an hour or 40 minutes, or the yoga we do for 30 minutes, or whatever that is, we excel ourselves. But then we know it's finished. You can take a rest. You can enjoy yourself. You can enjoy your free time. And that becomes the other side. Here we find true division, not made in advance, but true divisions that are actually in the nature. Activity and rest. So plan ahead, but see to that your uh, resilience gets stronger with the strange attractor. Repeat constantly in your head, because that's going to be your safety. And you will notice every time, and this is what I noticed, every time I test my verses, I have 33 verses coming from De Bono, every time I do that, so I repeat them constantly, and this is very important because that uh, 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 is what is a strange uh, attraction. It's a returning thing. And we showed it before uh, on the whiteboard, I think it was in Kölnerstad. And it's, it's amazing to look at, it's actually quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. I try to link some of those attractors to uh, the YouTube clip here. But they are beautiful things. And the repetition is a strange attractor. It makes for a soothing, calm point. And I, I usually compare this to the eye of the storm. I don't know if you know what that is, but if you have a really big tornado or something, in the middle of the tornado there is a part that is absolutely calm. It doesn't have any wind and it's even sunshine in there. And this is this repetition. It makes for a calmness so that you can push yourself, so to speak, to go into the next level and not be stuck in the polarities of black and white, good and bad. Uh, I, I've been thinking the last couple of weeks, especially of significance or meaning, that I, when I read a text, I design certain parts of the text meaning and the rest is like decoration. And I notice that behavior is very hard to escape, but becoming more resilient that means you can take in more. A lower chaotic system cannot take in a lot of things. And this is the point made of Rudolf Gachea. When you are at a level, lower level, you can't enter the text. It's just impossible. You need to train yourself for that. And this is why Gachea showed me for the first time, I understand deconstruction is actually a training method that you can understand more of text you already read. And that already happened to me. Things I read like 10 years ago, all of a sudden I realized I had too much of a polarized view on it. So it wasn't available for me. And this makes everything so great to fit together. This is. Uh, how we showed earlier how we cannot access the great works, the canonical works of Western literature anymore. And the reason is we are on a lower level. We cannot reach in the text. We can pretend to. But that makes us even more hungry for the contents. And also when it comes to art, we no longer see great art. We don't see architecture. I always thought to myself, how is it possible that we no longer surround ourselves with beauty around us? The reason is, of course, we can no longer appreciate it. And I don't mean on a superficial level that you just point and say, I can't see the beauty in that. Internally, we can't see it. 
even if we say we can see it, we cannot, because the complexities are way too small. And finally, I get an explanation for what I've been wanting to know for such a long time. Why did Renaissance painting disappear? How could it disappear? It's been developing for centuries, and it was all gone within one generation. Understanding was blocked. It didn't matter how much hard people tried, they couldn't understand it. And if it's not in the experience, nothing can convince a person to buy a painting. If they can't see it themselves. We have become untrue to our own existence. We do no longer perceive. We have become loop machines that only reduces the material we already have. My experience of the schooling system was the knowledge I had when I went into the schooling system that was just recasted, recategorized and renamed over and over again. And in the end, I start almost like the song, Is That All There Is? I don't know if you heard that one. Uh, it's from the 60s and it was a popular one for quite some time. Is that all there is? I felt that and it was a sort of disillusionment that caught my heart. And it almost stopped my heart in a way. Derrida was the opening up of light again to show it is not necessary like that. It doesn't have to be that way. It can be a direction, it can even be a goal. And the whole possibility of an actual permanence, I don't mean permanence as a belief or as a wish, because that is often a desperate wish. There are traits of desperation in the metaphysics of presence. You want what you can't have. And our wishing for presence will not make it happen. It doesn't matter how much we try to establish it. It will not come to us. Resilience and permanence don't come by our command. There is a reality and that reality has rules. Clear and understandable rules but still rules. Reality has a character to it. And what Derrida shows, and Rodolphe Gachet explicated so fantastically well, was that we can learn to know that world. There is actually an intellectual side to, it, uh, to reality as well. And that is what I call, uh, call the deeper understanding. A deepening that is not just polarities or simplifications. Something the computer can do. There's something I always thought when I started, began to study at a higher level. I was thinking this, this can be done by a computer. All of logic can be made by a computer, so to speak. This is something even the professor bragged about. And I felt, well, in that case, it's not worth that much. And now I realize, no, it's not like that. Human knowledge is much, much deeper than zeros and ones but we need to change ourselves because it's our shutting down of the system that sort of is part of the problem and the thing is to go stepwise this is almost a James Clarion model of doing the whole things don't go too hard on. I've done that loads of times. I locked myself in my chamber to read Derrida for two years. That's a bit too much. But we learn, we learn as time passes to be more careful with ourselves. Because once our system becomes more complicated and our thinking process gains this advantage of complexity and deepening and all those things we will also ourselves be able to master the situation because 
projection comes from this complexity and directedness. This directedness is literal. When I take in the surrounding, what is not part of me, as I think preemptively, to sort of shut out uh, certain parts of reality, say that's outside of me, I don't care about that, I should just care about the camera uh, and Kelly looking at me. If I take in this, the camera becomes clearer and I see Kelly clearer as well. So this is gaining in both ends and this is the promise of resilience, you don't lose out on anything. All sides get stronger at the same time. And I think the whole idea of a losing gain, that there should be something to pay to gain, is actually coming from the metaphysics of presence. That we have to give up ourselves, our, so to speak, subjective standpoint. This is uh, the idea of classical physics, is that in order to gain knowledge, you need to eradicate yourself. You have to become absolutely forehanded because you can't have both. I think we discussed this six or seven episodes ago. Uh, ago. Uh, Levinas also mentioned that. Uh, um, it is stuck into the classical physics, the idea that in order to perceive the origo and the XYZ, you need to take away yourself. In order to gain knowledge, you need to almost attack yourself. And having all private things on the side, your wants, your desires, your intentions, your emotions, your richer in the life, that you need to shut aside. But you don't have to do that. Actually, there's absolutely no need for that. And this is the incredible message coming from reality itself that Derrida shows us that we can gain in both ends and it's impossible not to gain in both ends because the more you become yourself the more you become aware taking in things the more you gain you don't lose out you gain for the maybe for the first time in your life you will be able to gain things more presence more understanding having multiple thoughts going on at the same time and being able to stand balance. I don't have to mm, uh, threaten my own balance as I stand here. I can be balanced in my body. I can also be calm in my mind. And that doesn't hinder me from sending out a message about resilience. That could be done at the very same time. And it also show, as long as you train, you are destined to succeed. There's nothing that can stop you. And little by little, we know that will cause change. So try to be careful with yourself, but not too careful. Uh, with a certain time frame, expose yourself to things that are what you think from the beginning be things that you don't like, hate, dislike, or even think you it's harmful for you. Because it turns out not to be harmful. Actually it could be the very goodness. And this is a sort of a understanding that should maybe be brought up on Asuncion, the day when Christ rise to heaven finally. Because he had suffered, but he also learned from that experience. Otherwise it would have been a useless experience. It wasn't. It was actually quite meant. Another thing that we gain by taking in reality, because this is all part of reality, and we do that, we also gain access to our inner world, which I probably call the endogenous side. And this is usually eradicated in modern uh, educational system because the teachers or the educational system doesn't know about that. They think that's part of privacy or something that you should keep in your dreams or something like that. You see here, it's like uh, they're trying to make the uh, the, Laplace, the, the Laplacian demon 
somebody who is not part of reality, but at the very same time in reality. We are force-fed with this paradox, I would say. And it came with the mother's milk. It came with our surroundings. We grew up in this. And uh, Derrida is sort of showing, look at this. Those limitations were already at place. Maybe the very moment you were born, or a bit later. And resilience is also the promise that you will be able to control your thinking. No longer do you have to be like Descartes, a passive process that just take stimuli from outside or your own thinking machinery. All of a sudden you can direct your thinking. You can have an awareness that lasts more than 20, 40, 30 seconds. And that awareness, you can see how that awareness can make you understand a text. A text is a complicated thing. If you don't have an awareness, how can you go into a massive text like Shakespeare? You cannot. Because you need to have both the start and the end and the middle going on at the same time. And our needle-like modern awareness doesn't allow that. We can only see one word at a time. We are like the cyclop, one-eyed, and maybe uh, nearsighted as well. So it's a sort of nearsightedness already present in our thinking. And if we follow our intuition, we will be taken further and further away from where we actually deserve to be. Strengthened, bigger and larger, and as very important for me, healthier, body-wise. Because with good thinking always come good balancing in the body. Less injuries, more flexibility, and I notice that to a great extent myself. I can do things balance up much better than I could only a couple of months ago. This is changing with my thinking. That's a short repetition here, what you should do. First, decide on what you're supposed to try or exercise. It should be decided before. Uh, decide when to start and when it should end. Really try to make a clear division before, between before and after. Because we humans and all animals and even plants, we do take rest and we do take activity. It's important to follow these real rules, not made up by us, but coming from reality itself. And you need to know these divisions in order to activate the strange attractor, because it subsides, lives in, so to speak, in reality itself. This is what makes it so tough, so strong. It's sort of a time slot, like a hole. It could be a hole in space, so you could do your exercise in a certain space. Sometimes that's the case. But very important, it's a time slot. It's a start and it's a beginning. And every time you do that, you tell your body, mind system, it's a start and it's an end. And it will know that it can force itself to the utmost during that time. And then, when it's over, you can take a rest. This is actually a trick I learned from Jesse Jensen, one of the marathon runners. He said, the more he focuses on the end and the start, the more he knows he can force himself. Because the ones who's losing are the ones who can't see the goal the rest, the reward, the, uh, the, the glory. This is incredibly important part of the thing. It's not just work, it's a glory as well, it's a reward. And resilience can also be its own reward because you get stronger every time. You understand more. Uh, 
a week ago I took the liberty to go back to text I read many years ago and all of a sudden I, I understand more. I'm gaining knowledge and I also realized were I to read that text 10 times over 10, 10 years ago I would not have gained anything because you need to gain complexity from within in being able to reach out to the other complexity. So I think 10 years ago representationalism was still lingering on. And it's part of this being in the lower intellectual level. That is representationalism. It's an oversimplification. It's not wrong in that sense. It's more an oversimplification. Because today, ordinary sense, I say, there is a chair there or there is not a chair. We can use representationalism, but it doesn't mean that it's fundamental to reality. That's quite another thing. The second thing is the stopping thing. The stop needs to be there, reinforce the stop. I think that is maybe the most problematic for modern people. Uh, when you go abroad, you often notice that people take a siesta. Here we have problems stopping. We just continue. And it might sound good, but it actually tells the system not to try its hardest. Because the body will think there is no rest, there is no goal, there is no teleolo teleology. There's nothing to gain. It is actually the idea of gaining something that makes you put extra effort. Don't take that away. And I would say that's a natural part of our makeup as human beings. And that's a natural rule, rule that we should obey. All peoples take siesta, for instance. I don't, it's just an example. Don't take siesta, I don't mean that. I mean it's a natural rule. You exert yourself and then you take a break. Very important. You need to stop. And that could be very hard. It's very hard for me. I directly, uh, I'm very hard to stop things. I want to continue forever and ever and ever. But I realize by doing that, I actually take away the energy I put in. It becomes less precise, less energetic. And what I gain in quantity, I lose in quality. And I think in the end, as James Clear uh, pointed out, you also lose out on quantity in the end. Because if you don't follow natural rules of the system, of course you lose out on all ends. Not just quality, but also quantity. Start out small, that's the third advice. Once you acquire the practice, and the timing that you do it every day or every once once a week or something like that so it becomes a second nature do remember to continue your strange attractor and i often liken those to those tibetan wheels i don't know if you've seen those but every time a tibetan passes a little temple they push wheels and um, the idea is to show that there is a continuance for each wheel they start to roll another wheel starts to roll, another wheel starts to roll. It's to show permanence and continuance and also direction. You do it when you go in a certain direction like this. This an idea you can keep in mind that there is a very clear direction. And once you start to learn that there is a teleology, there is a goal. Ordinary academic system, schooling system doesn't have a goal. They don't like progress. And I think maybe that's already part of what it has always already been. Socrates said all knowledge is out there. It has to be in his way of seeing the world. And therefore it can be no progress. You can just acquire what's already there. And I would say that's a rather pessimistic view on things. No wonder uh, that we are currently in pessimism. <clears throat> Something actually that uh, uh, Edward de Bono criticizes highly in his little article, uh, The Gang of the Free, Socrates, Aristotle and Plato. Now, once you start to understand, this is the last advice here, once you start to feel that things can have a purpose, 
there could be a directedness to what you do. The things you, you do are no longer as valueless as they used to be. Then you will also be able to put more energy into it. And that energy is both intellectual and quality-wise and quantity-wise. Your hand will serve your purpose better. Your balance will help every fiber of your body to make what you do stronger. But take it for one who really understood these things, was Jacques Derrida himself. What he produced is pure excellence. It's very hard to beat that production. Everything is sheer excellence. It's nothing to do with simple polarities. It is advanced, it's fulfilling, and it must have given him a very rich life. And he had certain goals that he sort of fulfilled during his lifetime. That makes you happy, and I would say, as chaotic systems indicates, that makes for eternity as well. Because I don't think the writers really die. I think that's an exaggeration coming from the lower standpoint, down here, where everything is black and white, start and finish, and there is nothing outside. You have your birth, you have your death, and there's nothing outside. This take of time is a lower complexity system. And it's not part of reality, it's actually more of shutting yourself off of reality. Remember what Bischoff said, uh, the constructive mathematician, that infinity lies underneath reality. It is not part of mathematics, it is part of reality. Whereas the Platonist mathemat mathematicians do the opposite. They say mathematics is eternal, but the world is not is full with end infinities and depression I don't know that's not true everything is like a big rose that both get wider and deeper and it's very hard to beat that positive message I'll say I think this is a good time to end and take a rest thank you very much and I wish you a very good afternoon